Just a quick housekeeping item. Today's event is being hosted on Zoom. We kindly ask that you make, you make sure your camera and mic are turned off during the presentation and the Q&A. Although it was wonderful to see all your faces here right now. If you have any questions, please send it through the group chat section. Doing so will help us make sure we can give you all the best experience for viewing the presentation without interruption. We have admin staff who are pulling together all of your questions so they don't get lost and will help our speaker get through as many as possible during the Q&A period, which will be conducted at the end of the presentation. Professor Gu has kindly agreed to answer as many questions as possible by 1 p.m. Now, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to pass the reins over to the chair of the School Lunch and Learn program, none other than Lori Hevela. Lori is an Electrical 65 graduate and one of our most dedicated and engaged members of our alumni community. Lori has been chairing the School Lunch and Learn program for several, several years and continues to generously give of his time to help continue the tradition in this virtual event space. And with that, I will pass it over to Lori to welcome our speaker for today's event. Thank you, Sonia. Today, we are excited to have Professor Frank Gu join us today. He is a professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Applied Chemistry. Today, he will be giving his presentation entitled Bridging Engineering and Entrepreneurship, Tackling Global Challenges in Sustainability and Health. We have received a very enthusiastic response to today's presentation, as Sonia mentioned, and we are happy to have Professor Gu here today to share this important work with us. Also, as Sonia mentioned, at the end of today's presentation, we will have time for questions and answers. Thank you to those who have already submitted questions during your registration. You are also welcome to ask questions in the group chat shown at the bottom of your screen. And then we will ask Frank to answer as many questions as possible at the end of his presentation. By way of introduction, Frank Gu is a professor and an NSERC chair in research chair in nanotechnology engineering in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Applied Chemistry. He received his BSc from Trent University in nearby Peterborough, his PhD from Queen's University in nearby Kingston, and his postdoctoral training from MIT and the Harvard Medical School in Boston. Before joining U of T in 2018, Dr. Gu was an associate professor at the University of Waterloo. He has established a frontier research program in nanotechnology engineering with important advances in medical and life science applications. His research has brought tangible impacts on his field and industry, including mucoadhesive materials for the treatment of dry eye disease, and photocatalytic water treatment technologies for the Canadian energy sector. And now, without further ado, we turn it over to Frank Gu. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much, Laurie and Sonia. Um, thank you, Laurie, for that introduction. Thank you for inviting me here. Good afternoon, everyone. So great to see so many alumni here. Um, can I just get a thumbs up from Laurie, if you can see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay, awesome. So um, before we begin, I just maybe I'll just start with this. Uh, Lori and Sonia, uh, you know when you when you guys invited me to uh, to today's lunch and learn, and I remember Sonia wrote to the, me an email and it said something in the line of, "We're we're inviting you to speak at the lunch and learn uh, because we hear you do crazy research." And I remember at that moment I started thinking in my head. Thank you, thank you for saying that. Um, exactly what part of my work you think is crazy? And you know, the more I, I thought about that, I, I realized that it's great that I, if I start today um, to share with you a few examples of my work that I, I think it's, in fact, you will realize it's in fact pretty crazy. My research uh, is just titles showing here is really about building nanometer scaled materials um, and building them into structures and making them useful um, for the healthcare and environmental protection applications. So 
let's start by just looking at, in, in terms of my work, um, the reality of the, the scales um, and the dimension of nanotechnology. All of us here, uh, our alumni, know very well from your unit conversion class in, in undergraduate time and onward um, about the conversion of a nanometer. Now, we all know that one meter is about one billion nanometers um, or one, uh, one nanometer is about one billionth of, of a meter. So, you know, that's just something that we talk about conversion between units. And it's one thing to, to work on this on paper, on looking at unit conversions, but I think it's a totally different to really appreciate um, just how small are we talking about the scales and, and using that level of scale to do research. So to really illustrate the kind of things that I do every day and the students in my group are trained um, and, and they are the masters of this uh, particular domain, um, it's really good to have an al analogy. So here, here's one, okay? Um, here we go. Let's take a look at this photo here. Um, what you have here is uh, the picture of planet Earth. And I brought it here just for some um, an, an, an picture, uh, reference that this, is, this was the first picture that was taken uh, from actual uh, photography, a camera um, from space. And this picture was taken by a satellite deployed in NASA uh, back in 1967. And that was the very first time that we saw what our actually planet Earth looked like um, from its whole view. And this satellite was about uh, 20,000 um, kilometers, um, uh, 30,000 kilometers from the surface of the Earth. So it was far, far away to take a picture uh, to get a whole glimpse of Earth. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is that I, I thought there was a great analogy to the kind of things that I, I do in nanometer scale. And you might wonder, why am I putting up a photo of the Earth to, um, to talk about the scale? It's really just the talking about the power of a billion, a billionth of magnification. We looked at, if you look at this uh, picture on the Earth, the distance from the North Pole to the South Pole is about 20,000 kilometers uh, in distance for someone to fly from one to another without nonstop in a direct flight. And if you think about that as um, a power of one, one billionth of that is essentially 20 millimeters um, in diameter. In reality, if something that we re all reference to is a nickel. So a billionth magnification is like literally looking for a nickel um, using a telescope to look and zooming in and find that nickel on the surface of the earth. That's one billionth of magnification. In my research and among many nano engineering uh, researchers here at university, um, the things that we do is making materials in a beaker or test tube, almost the same as everything you can imagine in other disciplines when it comes to material and chemical engineering. But as a matter of fact, if you think about just type of difficulties and, and the level of challenge you're doing, looking at a nanometer long structure that we are building is literally the same as looking um, through the earth, looking for a nickel. That's, that's really looking at a beaker leveled material versus looking at a, a stru structure at a billion meter, a billionth of magnification. It's literally is looking at a nickel. So. For all of our alumni, you've all gone out and doing very successful in your career in engineering and business. <clears throat> now, I just imagine someone come, your, your member of your team come to your office um, and, and ask, hey boss, I found a nickel in London. Hey boss, I found another nickel in Washington. And I found a nickel in Tokyo. That's kind of the level of analogy <laughs> that, that you can imagine when the students in our labs are come to talk to, to, uh, uh, to share their discovery on finding individual structures. That's one billionth of magnification. Now, with all, all the uh, jokes aside, now, if you look at um, what's really happening in this world um, in the last 20 years, you know, in addition to think about that crazy magnification scale, another aspect that I, I just wanna highlight here before we talk about my work is really about the amount of science and um, commercialization success 
that's been put on because of what we've done in the nanoscale engineering. And that's really, um, so if I tell you, you know, the structures that we are seeing here, this is a review paper that uh, my, my team did a few years ago. And they're just looking at the various ways you can make nanoparticles into different shapes. You know, you can see the, the one on the lower uh, uh, right corner is a little dumbbell shaped all the way to cubes, squares, and uh, multifaceted structures. You know, it's one thing to make them, but it's a totally different thing to actually see them uh, with our naked eyes using microscopy to zoom in and looking at these structures at a nanometer scale. 20 years ago, um, for our alumni who graduated from 2020 and prior, um, to have such a tool available, one is about just a scarcity. There isn't so a lot of things available. And second is um, just the, in terms of the resolution and power, it would take days to gather images like this. As of today, um, here at, at, in the Department of Chemical Engineering, we have a surface uh, chemistry analysis lab that has powerful tools that undergraduate students or even under um, will have the capability to train and image structures like this. What you're seeing here are individual, individual structures um, in a nanometer scale. And, um, and, and with that, I just think that there's also a level of that craziness um, and, and the hard work between the knowledge from the academia world and the industry over the last 20 years that actually made it possible so that we can now engineer and, and um, image nanoscale structures as a routine job. And I think it's because of this type of routine standard SOP that have been developed over the last 20 years. And this is really the reason why we are now at its ability to in fact monetize what we have discovered and, and making it into a translational opportunity. So, so that's, that's something I wanted to start with. Now, um, moving forward, I just give you some ideas on uh, the type of things you could do um, uh, using these nanostructured materials. There's a lot of properties that are just not available when it comes to real scale um, engineering um, at a bulk scale. So for, for one example, by using nanostructured uh, materials, you have an almost an infinite increase of surface area. One example I always talk to my students is, you can in fact paint four airport runways with one bucket of paint. Because if, if you line up every single bucket, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the paint um, latex spheres, and you calculate the surface area of all the latex in there, in that one bucket of paint, in terms of resolution of nanoscale, and you spread that at a linear and planetary scale, that's enough to cover that many runways. There are other opportunities that created um, just very fascinating scientific and also business opportunities is in terms of stability. When materials are dropped to nanometer scales, they no longer exhibit things that you saw at a box scale. For example, they never sunk anymore. Imagine you throwing a rock, they will never sunk. Well, in the nanometer scale, that's literally what's happening, that the nanoparticles do not settle. So there's increased level of stability and buoyancies. Also, um, there's numerous applications that looked into photonic properties. Um, for example, you can create all the colors that you're seeing on this photo uh, from anywhere from red to blue to green using the same material. And as a matter of fact, a couple of uh, frontier researchers here at the university, um, most notably uh, Professor Warren Chan, is really a, a, a world um, a frontier expert in manipulating nanoscale objects and creating colors, not using different color materials, but using one single material. And I'll tell you some of the applications we're working on on that in just a bit. And finally, you can create things that has a high performance, high strength, and still be able to, uh, to do uh, a real uh, fundamental hard work. So for example, uh, one example is that you can in fact now creating nanostructured enabled applications in a bulletproof vest that is thin and flexible and still be able to provide that impact address. Um, for a lot of us um, who are interested in comics, um, the Spider-Man suit isn't so much of a science fiction anymore. And there's a lot part of the research that in fact are making some aspect of that more and more into a reality. So that's just some imagination that I hope to draw upon on the type of things that could be enabled uh, and possible. Now, going back to uh, nanostructured materials and its application in my group, 
and I might just say that we work on a number of different applications. And, and over the last uh, 15 years or so, we were fortunate enough to work with some of the largest and, uh, and uh, supporting industries uh, in this continent. And together we have done uh, uh, some really good work in translating the nanostructure material that you saw in the previous slides uh, into something that's towards applications um, and, and towards mainstream applications. So in my lab, we work on sensors, development of sensors, uh, development of therapeutics um, for um, vision care and for others. And we're also working on this photonic properties that you can explore that um, for energy applications, as well as for environmental applications. And, um, you know, it's uh, be happy to share with all the things that are developing in the, in the work. Uh, but I just thought maybe today in the interest of time, I'll give you some examples of the type of things we do um, that bridges um, the knowledge from at a fundamental level to what's currently being doing um, for industrial translate knowledge translation. So the first uh, example that I'll show you is something that it's still in the early stage, but it's uh, it's shown some uh, very interesting potentials, and um, this is related to developing microbial indicators. One of the reasons I brought this up as a, as a topic today is that I think because of COVID and the, in the midst of the pandemic, um, there is extraordinary interest on developing sensors and test kits um, that can help us to explore and identify microbial organisms. And um, so let's start with something like this and, and, and just show you some of the examples on, on the using of nanotechnology for, um, for these applications. This research started about 10 years ago, and the idea that we had was, will we be able to identify individual microbes without actually using genetic testings or agar plates? And if we're able to do so, it, it simply would offer an alternative um, and also a very powerful way of quantifying um, microbes um, that we simply wouldn't be able to see with our naked eyes. And to do this, I'll just draw back to the example, how does this work? Um, in, a, in a material sense. Earlier, we talked about the ability of manipulating objects at a nanometer scale and the ability to manipulate that um, in, in creating different colors out of single material. And that's actually the, the fundamental property that we're using it um, for these applications. So in this picture here, if you're looking at on the left side, um, there's uh, a red color um, a well and there's a blue color well. These colors are made entirely out of a single material. And the reason we can make them different is by controlling the size. And by making a bigger size material, we can change the color from, um, from, uh, from red to blue, or by reducing it to a lower, smaller size, and you can turn them back to, to uh, red. So that's a manipulating the size. And one of the group members in my team thought about manipulating that for sensor applications is that instead of actually making two different kinds of size of materials, we can use one size. And by changing the distance between these materials, then you can create the same type of a plasmonic resonant um, as, uh, imaging uh, color and properties that you would be able to do on, on the left side. So the picture on the right-hand side is something that we developed in our lab too, that you can see, you can create a red and blue color by using the same material, but by changing the distance between them, you can manipulate the colors and you can turn the color from one to another and back and forth and, and so forth. So that's the power of nanotechnology. And what we have done since then was in fact, changing the controlling the particle size between them and put them on a surface of microbes. And um, earlier we talked about how small they are, finding a nickel on the planet uh, Earth it's the same thing here. Um, in fact, microbes are so much, so much bigger than these particles, so much so that, you know, you can scatter millions of these materials on a single microbial surface. And by changing the distance between, uh, between individual uh, particulates, according to their species surface properties, we can create a variety of colors um, just by no looking at the nature of individual patterns. And this was the very front, uh, first thing that we thought of creating a genomic um, uh, independent fingerprint. So you, we don't have to identify individual uh, species through its genome analysis, but in, just, in fact, looking at a surface property to give us the topographical uh, characteristics 
and use that as a, as a form of identifying um, the organisms. Without going through all the details in the back, um, there's, there's just a lot of hard work um, from, um, from students and researchers that in fact made them into a much smarter and detectable strain that not only we are able to uh, identify individual organisms, but we can start to fingerprint um, the, the ubiquitous, but also unique part of individual surface properties on these microbes and use them towards a future diagnostic test. Um, in the last few years, we had the opportunity to work with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And in, for, in fact, we can further improve that, that instead of looking at identifying individual species, there's an opportunity that we can even identify individual strains strains in, in, within a single species. So that's one example of the type of research that we're working on in lab and trying to make them into uh, particular useful applications by manipulating um, objects that are, are, that are around nanometer scales. The other example that I'd like to show you um, is something that's further down the line in terms of technology development and, and towards more on the entrepreneurship side is harvest, harvesting sunlight um, as a natural energy to power for environmental protection applications. And this, going back to chemical engineering principles, is something that we um, always involve in using catalysis. What catalysis means here is, is that we're using the material over and over again. And this material is not gonna age, uh, but in fact, performing the same job uh, over and over again. So one example of catalysis in our, is, is the enzymes in our body. Uh, for example, the enzymes that are breaking down food in our intestine tract, as long as the enzyme maintains active, it's able to do the same job over and over again, um, provided there's sufficient energy to activate that. Now, another form of catalysis is instead of powered by biological energy is powered by photon energy. And this has been used um, for decades when people have, have, have applied photo um, energy powered um, treatment um, known as advanced oxidation treatment or AOP in municipal drinking water and other uh, water treatment applications. There's applications in applying catalysis materials into concrete that buildings are able to clean itself. Um, so you've seen there, there, there's a couple of uh, really well examples, particularly in Europe. And finally, this is also the same principle that we're using uh, to develop photovoltaics and uh, harvesting solar energies. What my lab has done uh, over the last uh, you know, decade or so was really just about one fundamental example. We know that these catalysis work and they know they work very well for water, but are we able to do this? The same thing that you saw in the previous slide, but without a power, um, electrical power input. So in other words, think about it. Are we able to do the same thing in terms of bringing the power of catalysis but relying on sunlight and other naturally uh, abundant energy source to power the same reaction towards environmental protection and treatment applications. And over the years, um, we've realized that there are materials that are highly catalytic, so highly efficient towards treatment applications, um, but it's important that the engineering job is to bring them to the source where the energy lies. So for water treatment applications, um, we've developed a way to bring these treatment materials to the surface of water. Um, in, uh, we talk about buoyancy, but really the natural word is we're trying to make them float, make them float in ways that, that is best towards its treatment application. And um, how we did it is, is a different story. It takes lots of development and, and knowledge towards um, improving its properties, but eventually we came up with ability to do this um, with a fairly persistent pattern. And from that, um, we formed a company, and the company is called H2Nano, and it's spun out of my academic lab. And what we found is essentially a way of, of developing this material um, in its ability to um, perform separation and ability to um, um, uh, group themselves by floating naturally on the water surface. So by doing this, we're now able to treat water um, by maximizing its ability to receive sunshine because um, it's floating right to the air water interface. But it also created an ability for us to do this uh, to power water treatment tools that you're no longer bound 
um, by the turbidity, or in other words, the cloudiness of water. So we can treat this in brine, we can treat this in a, in a much murkier water without actually doing um, a further purification um, and, and still be able to enjoy the power of this treatment benefits. So that's how um, the, the formulation of this um, material and then to bring it to a commercial sense. And um, working with a number of, um, of uh, energy producers um, as a partners, we've tried to uh, develop this into a, a commercial sense. And for I just wanted to maybe just highlight a few things that we have learned along the way um, that is uh, quite uh, different than what I expected. So first is about the science itself. Uh, and this is something that professors and researchers at the university are really uh, focused at. We develop ways to understand a scientific phenomena and scientific uh, understanding on how the treatment work. So for the, in the case of this floating treatment cap capability by H2 Nano, we were able to identify how the treatment works. And not only to that, we were able to, do, to identify how to actually make this into a more uh, treatment land landslide. So here in the photo, we show that uh, we've done this indoor on a little beaker, outdoor again in a little beaker, and using very, very sophisticated tools, we were able to identify um, and pinpoint tens of thousands of organics in these industrially processed and impacted water. And not only we are able to identify them, we can use the tools to track how these compounds change in, um, in response to treatment uh, from the sunlight and, and, and treatment landscape. Those are the things that, that was uh, just pure fun from a, from a scientific uh, research and development perspective. But in order to actually make this thing effective and also practical, the, in addition to having that fun part of research, the next part is really about bringing this to the scale with the right practicality towards deployment. So in, in terms of technology, I wanna share with you a video of this doing a summer trial of the same study we did um, at, uh, at, in Waterloo that you're seeing is a treatment scale. Now notice the scale, right? The, in the previous one we did was a little beaker. And now we started to put them onto a, a bigger perspective towards a, a bigger beaker. And this was about, um, about 20,000 times the size from the beaker to a cubic meter treatment size. And you can see that instead of having these little uh, magnetic stirs, we are now starting to rely on big um, power mixers. And again, the beauty of this work was that we're still able to, to, uh, to potentially deploy this whole regimen um, completely powered by sunlight because just the energy consumption and still be able to prove that it's, it's working. And then after that, um, that was the first step of towards uh, real scale um, prototype development. Um, then we were uh, working with our uh, industrial partner um, in, uh, in Alberta. Uh, we were um, uh, lucky that we, we got made it through that first round of prototype development. We then moved on to the second prototype development, which is a, a little uh, bigger. Uh, it's about, again, uh, 100 times bigger than we, had, we have done um, in the previous photo. So here you're seeing here is the, was the photo taken from actual pilot site. And I'll just turn on the next slide here. You can see the drone. We had a drone photographer to show what's happening in these pilot reactors um, by, by flying through and, and looking at the image on the, uh, on the drone. So this again, showed a fairly successful deployment of the treatment protocol um, and treating it in, in, um, in mine and industrially processed impacted water. And so from the little beaker that was really about 20 millimeters in water now to about, um, uh, about a, a, a 40 cubic meter of scale um, in a course of three years, it was, um, it was quite an accomplishment um, just from giving ourselves uh, the understanding, what would it take to actually make things a little bit bigger? But to stop here would be insufficient. <laughs> we in fact try to make it even bigger. So here is a scale of the deployment that we are planning and for, for, um, for the next phase of evaluation. So the little beaker that is no longer on the bench, uh, you're now seeing on the scale, uh, we're making it essentially another 10X in scale. Um, the, the, beaker, the, uh, the secant containers you're seeing in the previous slide, it's now the one in the, in the squeeze in the center of the slides. And what we're actually showing here 
is, is an even a bigger um, scale demonstration. And that's, that's the scale that we, uh, we feel, wow, that's pretty big. Well, that's pretty big until we actually see where the real impact of water can in fact make a difference. So here, this is a photo that we've taken from the site um, that was given to us um, uh, in, in courtesy of Suncor. This is one of their pond. This is, they, they, they're, you know, when it comes to impact, impact of water, um, some of these ponds, it's just purely huge. If you thought about the, the scale that we developed in the previous slides, and just guess how big was that biggest one that we are the prototype we're developing in the, in the overall reclamation of one of the sites that could potentially being uh, used for this technology. Can you take a guess? Well, I actually draw this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this size, but it's so small that I have to make it flash um, so that you could, I made it jump, jump and wiggle so you know exactly where the size in comparison of, of where this size is. So over this course of development of, uh, of, of this technology demonstration, um, you know, from my perspective, it's, it's just the humble, humbling experience of knowing, bring academic work to an industrial application. Scientific matter is one, um, but the, the scale and practicality is what actually drives the, um, the work forward. So I'd like to close uh, my talk here just by talking about some of the work that we, uh, we, we, uh, we are working along the journey here um, and potentially just give you a little bit of um, my, my, my own learning experience uh, from this journey. You see my training, my entire academic research training um, in, a, in a very simple way of saying it is really about finding answers. Um, and and we, we look for answers based on facts, data, um, chemical engineering principles. And, um, and the work that we do in the lab is about finding an answer in a very controlled environment um, to understand how the, how the phenomena work and, and through how to individually in, manipulate parameters to do that. That's what I do every day. And the research data that we get is a clear cut. It's either it did work or it didn't. And as we learn about the technology development through uh, a, a scaling and, and, um, and further proving it towards a real scale application, um, by the time you're looking at TRL development, um, when, when we started moving away from the academic lab and more towards uh, prototype development and full scale development is um, really started gaining that appreciation um, and about the complexities in the natural environment and the operator experience. And moving forward, just by looking at the kind of things that we do, we also realize that the technology development is only one factor, is important, but it's, it's only one factor that's involved here. Um, to actually make this into a commercial adoption, um, it's, it's, it's not just about the technology at all. It's in fact, it has to do with a lot of complex factors in business, timing to market, um, the customer success and satisfaction. How does this thing eventually get monetized and generate a reasonable rate of return? Understanding the financial analysis and forecast, all of that is far beyond the initial knowledge that we do. So my talk here today is really about um, integrating academic research and entrepreneurship. Um, from a personal pers experience, my, my own experience, this has proven to be an extremely positive and fun and rewarding in the ways that I never actually expected it from the beginning. And, um, you know, the academic research has largely produced um, some scientific rigor to gathering data and facts. But when it comes to entrepreneurship, particularly about doing this from um, business and, and working with contract uh, contractors and, and other partners with contracts, um, you know, I, I, I found really inspired um, by Rick George, uh, who was the former mm -hmm. CEO, president and CEO of Suncor. And I think Rick really is fair that he has the one, the one who built Suncor into Canada's largest integrated energy company. And he, he has uh, training uh, that bridged between engineering, law and business. 
And one of the things that I found was particularly inspiring from Rick, um, I, from his book, um, A Sunrise, was about bridging the engineering training into business. Um, and I found it really resonate. I just wanted to share with you. I remember he was saying something in, in that the experience in recognizing the existence um, and the significance of the gray areas in order to reach a fair decision. And um, as a professor and also an entrepreneur, I found that um, working with established companies, it's, it's just a, a, um, um, an essential ability and skill um, to be able to build both um, deep understandings um, on, on both sides of the, um, the company, the, the company and, and, and negotiation. So we found this is for our alumni here. Um, this is my personal journey, stepping out of textbooks, uh, stepping out of literature references and prior arts and, and, and be able to understand, bring an engineer to product and material and execution based on judgment and intuition into something that's more towards reality. So um, I wanna close here by saying, thank you for inviting me here to this lunch and learn session. And um, I, I find it's not just about me sharing what I learned. I really hope that this was a chance that I can uh, find a way to learn from you, um, all the alumni here um, and your life lessons. And I think that could really um, brings a synergy and together um, you know, between our students, staff, um, faculties and alumni, we will be able to build something um, that are fundamentally innovative um, according to our U U U of T's standard and in, in, in scientific rigor, but still be able to bring a real and, and valuable impact to our community and stakeholders. So with that, I, uh, I wanted to thank um, all the researchers that we have ever worked with from my groups and beyond on uh, the fundings organizations, most notably uh, NZERC, um, and, and they are really the reasons between the, the, the staffs who worked here and the funding organizations are the reasons why these research activities are, uh, are able to take place. I also like to, to thank our Dean, uh, my chair, for um, really just, I, I feel for alumni, I think you all know, um, these are the, the people who really created an uplifting environment to support these engineering research and technology translation. Finally, I, I just want to, again, thank Lori and Sonia uh, for inviting me here and thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Frank. We've already got a few questions posted. So I will begin by asking them uh, the first question and I'm reading, I was wondering what environmental impact these nano nanostructures would have if they were to be accidentally released into the natural landscape? Yeah, that's a, um, that's a very, very insightful um, part. And as engineers, uh, that would, um, the, the impact would be, uh, would be bad. And so th for, for us, the best way to ensure that the impact on these nanomaterials to the environment is minimized is not using nanomaterials at all. So let me just clarify that, is that we are, our work, um, the, uh, the product pipelines and, and the research is powered by our understanding of nano, um, nanotechnology and engineering. But the actual deployment of these engineering solutions is in fact building on uh, microstructured and larger structured materials. So there are nano incorporation in, involved but we're doing everything we can and not to have any um, nanoparticles uh, being built in. And so that's, um, that's the best way we can, we can leave it there. So the technology is scientifically inspired by nano, but the actual prototypes are in fact built in so that it's not the nanoparticles are being built in there. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from John Banka. He had posted it uh, online before the meeting. And now again in the chat, and it reads as follows. I have seen NSERC research grants for individuals covering simple individual projects. But what happens when you have a large project that will require a team and many skills to do the research? How can this be funded? 
in many ways, John, I'm I'm worried about and thinking about the same thing. <laughs> How, this is an in, in uh, eternal struggle. Um, but I, I, I think there's one thing we can uh, acknowledge that there are uh, NSERC um, and other funding organizations, they have different tiers of funding and different categories of funding. There are individual ones. And then also there are the multi-group um, and the larger consortium building models. We found a lot of success using NSERC funding um, from the strategic network um, and from um, a larger type of uh, um, uh, the CRDs, as well as the, the current alliance program. I found those are particularly useful in building those knowledge translations. And then there are many other uh, partnered uh, programs with NSERC or, or individual uh, that more or less focused on larger technology development. And there are one that are you know, geared towards funding TRL one to three. And then there are those that are funding towards six to nine. So th there are different categories. Uh, another question from, uh, have you worked on or are you aware of applications to food processing, i.e. the manufacturing of food products? Uh, that's a very, um, very interesting part. We have been looking at and aware of the um, food processing industry and particularly to do with the mine to their uh, uh, impact of water. So the ability to um, make the water uh, more recyclable for internal use, lower their demand to draw water from municipal sources, um, lowering their operational cost and better for the environment, uh, treatment for water return. Those are the area that we worked on. In terms of the actual food processing engineering aspect, we have not. And I really uh, look forward if, if you have any uh, uh, insights or uh, suggestions on where this can go. A uh, question from Emil Fung. What is the first targeted industrial application for the solar pass technology that you spoke about in your presentation? Um, the first adoption is uh, towards um, treatment of large surface waters. Uh, so these are um, uh, energy, uh, energy industry process waters that are stored in um, large water holding ponds. And the first application is geared towards addressing um, uh, treatment and uh, remediation of those water using the solar pass technology. Another question from Neil Chung. First of all, thank you for sharing your experience. I am wondering what the differences or possibilities or advantages or disadvantages might be between transfer of research to established companies versus a startup? Mm. Any thoughts would be appreciated. That's, uh, that's not something we can answer. Um, it's, it's a long discussion. And I welcome your thoughts there too. And I, I feel there are, it depends really on the nature of the technology itself there are those that are readily adoptable. Um, there is a clear path towards knowledge translation. Um, then, you know, you, there's really a flexibility that you can choose on one or the other. But I think a lot of times, either there is no addressable market to begin, or there is a, it's not so much of a clear path towards how to quickly adopt the technology. That's when it becomes uh, a decision on, on choosing licensing or partnership or, or spinoff and started on it all. And um, there's no, there's never been a, a clear cut way of doing that. It's, um, it's just something I, I find it's intuitively about the technology itself. Thank you. Uh, another question from my Lunch and Learn colleague, Jim Courtney, and this has to do with the funding question. Have you been able to get assistance from the U of T Engineering's entrepreneurship hatchery so close to home? Thank you, Jim. Um, I, uh, to date, we have not, um, but, but let me just say that it's, um, I, I, am, uh, uh, I am a very, very young and new member of the U of T Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering community. Um, this is only my third year here at U of T. Um, I was at University of Waterloo for 10 years prior to that. 
So I'm still learning about what's what's available here at the university um, and, and the environment towards entrepreneurship and technology translation. So I welcome any um, uh, connections and suggestions on, on bridging this to uh, the next steps. Good. Uh, another qu follow-up question from Neil Chung again. Is there any work in your area around carbon capture, which is a yes. subject of much interest? <laughs> yes, um, yes, yes, we are. Um, the, the, the work that we do, uh, we have uh, made ourselves uh, into the world. We have, uh, uh, I'm uh, pleased to say that there's the opportunity towards water reclamation, water remediation. There's also a huge opportunity to leverage this towards uh, GHG emission reductions and other um, uh, associated benefits towards air quality improvements. Um, and, and I'd be happy to chat with you offline on that. I don't see immediately any other questions online, so I'll revert uh, to one of the questions that was submitted during the registration for this meeting from Eric Floro. And the question is, how do we integrate better health diagnostics into the future of the industry? Yeah, that's a, that's, I mean, monetize, I mean, that's a, that's a million dollar question. Uh, I, I, I feel what we are researching and what we can power uh, for the future in diagnostic is um, potentially improving uh, some of the things that it's currently um, a lack of improvement. So for example, alternative options um, that are used for areas or environment that are not um, uh, clippable to, uh, to uh, the, the, techno the current technology. So for example, in areas that are rural, uh, remote areas and lack of uh, professional or technical expertise, then the diagnostic, uh, the modern diagnostic sometimes can really much dependent on the operator. So if we can take that uh, um, gradually towards more uh, streamlined uh, or easy to interpret uh, ways, then that could make the diagnostic more powerful. We also find there's numerous opportunity towards uh, the uh, improvement of false positive or false negative, those that could be very costly. Um, and so the, the ability to improve quality control and quality assurance could ultimately lead to uh, further ability to um, in, you know, improve the, the technology itself. Um, but the ability to, in fact, making a monumental uh, improvement um, to make it more accurate and, and precision requires additional fundamental science to power that. Thank you. We, we had a much earlier question from Mariana Greenblatt. Uh, first off, uh, fantastic research. How can you be contacted? If I recall your opening slide had your email address <laughs> on it, maybe you could flip back to it so he or she can copy down the email address or anybody else that wants to follow up with you. Well, thank you. I, I am a uh, faculty member here in the chemical engineering department. Um, if you Google Frank Chemical Engineering and University of Toronto, um, there are two Frank Goos, by the way. It's not a joke. Um, and I, I, I got this mistake a few times. There is a Frank Gu in electrical engineering. And he is a, a graduating student and he think he's a class 2021 or 2020. Other than that, I'm, I'm the only Frank Gu out there. So if you search on Google, uh, you will find me there. But I, I will, I'll, uh, if, if maybe I can ask Steve or Sonia if you can post my email, uh, f.gu at utoronto.ca um, after the call. That would be really appreciated. What, wasn't that on your opening slide, if I recall? Uh, that's the, our Twitter, our lab Twitter. Uh, oh, okay. So you're welcome to follow that too. Uh, I do not see any other uh, questions from the audience, so I'm going to begin to wrap up. First of all, thanking everybody for all of the questions from our audience members today. Obviously, we want to thank Professor Gu for being with us today, and we invite your feedback on School and Lunch and Learn. Those of you that have participated today, there will be a link to an online survey 
made available in the chat and also will be shared with you after this event. Also, a link to Frank's presentation will also be shared with all of those who registered for this event this week. Uh, traditionally, the school lunch and learn events are hosted on the second Wednesday of each month uh, from October through to May, which means that our last remaining presentation will be on Wednesday, May 12th, featuring the chair of the Department of Material Science and Engineering, Professor Glenn Hibbard, and the su subject of his presentation will be De-Siloing the Materials Landscape, an update on the Franklin 21 Centenary Celebration. As I mentioned, this May event will be our final event for the, this year's Lunch and Learn, although we look forward to resuming a new session in October of this year. We obviously would like to acknowledge and thank MBNA, the credit card people who are sponsors of School Lunch and Learn through U of T's Pillar Sponsorship Program. If you're interested in learning more about School Lunch and Learn, please contact the alumni office at events at engineering.utoronto.ca. In closing, I would like to thank you for joining us for today's meeting and hereby adjourn today's session of School Lunch and Learn. Meanwhile, have a safe and healthy day. Again, thank you for joining us today.